Um, so the overall role of invasive species, if we can kind of combine these three different um, areas of, of analysis together, is again, species invasions are tied to all these transgressive events. That's what providing a mechanism for the species to move around. But once they get into the new basins, what they're doing is basically stopping new species from forming. Extinction isn't going crazy. Extinction is elevated, but not above background. The real difference is that speciation um, by vicarians is just stopped. Um, and so really, it looks like the long-term effects, if we want to project invasive species into the future, it looks like um, basically our modern fauna has a lot of problem with extinction from habitat degradation, um, and maybe not so much from invasive species. But because we've got all these invaders in our modern ecosystem, it's going to be very hard for modern species to bounce back and replenish that diversity that is being lost on a daily basis. So that's kind of the long-term cautionary tale um, for what we need to think about. The other thing, um, the other byline is that, of course, we couldn't understand this. We really couldn't dissect this pattern if you can't look at both the spatial relationships, the bi biogeography, in the evolutionary context. You really have to look at them together to be able to come up with these types of results um, and these types of ways of thinking about <coughs> questions. Okay, so that's the Devonian story. Invasive species bad, stop speciation, problem for long-term recovery in the modern. And it's not very happy. Um, okay, so what are we doing now? Well, one of the things that I just told you is that the Devonian is diametrically opposed to the modern. But those are the only two data points that exist. We have no idea what the percentage of vicariance and dispersal is at any other time in our history because it's never been looked at. So we really need to understand this better. Understand that the, the Devonian really is weird, the modern is weird, there's this back and forth throughout geologic time. We really don't have a handle on that. So um, where we are some more times when we've got a lot of invasion going on. And of course, um, a beautiful, wonderful time of invasion um, is right here in Cincinnati. So right at the, of course, in the seat the Maysvillian, or I'm sorry, at the end of the Maysvillian, you have this big influx of species um, from the mid-continent and the Arctic area coming down here in the Richmondian. Same problems. And of course, the fossils in Cincinnati are incomparable. They're just wonderful. Um, stratigraphy is now well known. Um, you know, Steve Holland has done a really nice job working out a sequence stratigraphic framework where we can tie, tie things across timelines. Um, and so this seems to be a really great time, and I live in Ohio, um, so this seems to be a great time to come look at Cincinnati. And so that's what we want to do next. So we've gone to museum collections, um, spent some quality time with Brenda, and she has wonderful collections, um, and looking at the data that exists. So here are point data now that exists for the Cincinnati. Um, you know what these fossils look like. Um, and so we can start tracking species through time. So this is Hebertella. Um, and here it is in the, C in the Macmillan, here's its Arnheim range, um, here's what it's doing in the Waynesville, um, and here's where it is in the Liberty. So we can start watching these guys move through time. Um, but again, as we talked about, while drawing these polygon maps is really a good first start, we'd like to do that more advanced model using the sedimentary parameters. And so that's what my three students are doing for their theses. Um, and so, um, but our basic data, we can take, the, take our species and, and subdivide them. Those that lived only in the Maysvillian and go extinct. Those that live in the Maysvillian and keep going. Um, those that move in. I'm sorry, these guys, green guys. Those that move in um, during the Richmondian. And those um, that are new in the Richmondian, but speciated from original natives. So if we move our species into these, three, these four categories, we can do some of that stats again. Um, and so this is preliminary data at this point. But we've got some compelling things that are going on. First of all, if you look at the range of native species, it was really broad. Some had big and small ranges, some had big ranges. And if you look at the invaders, they're somewhere in the middle. So the invaders are moving in, occupying area, basically range sizes that were already here. Um, and however, if you look at the species that's in, that were native, those that are Maysvillian only, the ones that go extinct, versus those that carry over, those that persist. The ones that go extinct are the ones with small ranges. The ones that survive had larger ranges. So some of these same patterns that you're seeing in the Devonian are starting to crop up in our early Cincinnati data. Um, and then if you look at, at the range
ranges versus size, you can see again, um, the new species that form, basically they're everywhere. So new species forming after the invasive regime, it really doesn't matter about the invaders anymore. But getting across the interval seems to. Um, also, if we look at the speciation issue, we have done a phylogeny for Hubertella. We have done a revision of this um, genus's um, species. And uh, I had a former master's student do this. And again, look at this. Only two vicariant events and five dispersal events. So we're seeing the same pattern of not very much vicariance going on in the middle, in the face of one of these invasive regimes. So overall, uh, the story on the Cincinnati has really just started. We've got a lot of work to do. We want to go out and make stratigraphic columns, start understanding the variables um, of the environment in which these different brachiopod species were living. We want to look on, um, so Brad, raise your hand. This is Brad. Brad's going to be looking at the Coryville and Mount Auburn brachiopods. Nikki. Nikki's looking at the Arnheim. And Rob. Rob's looking at the Whitewater and Waynesville and Liberty. So um, these guys are going to be walking from before all the way through the Richmondian invasion so that we can look at what's going on before, during, and after. So we're really looking forward um, to seeing the results of this project um, and working with you guys um, to help get a really strong data set. You guys know where all the good outcrops are. Um, and so we're really looking forward to kind of tapping your expertise and, and um, working with you guys, um, trying to, to do the best job we possibly can in terms of data collection for this project. Um, and so um, then I'd like to conclude. Thank you very much for listening and, and sharing your evening with me and, and having me down. It's been really fun. I look forward to continued collaboration and getting to know all of you much better as we work through these projects. Thank you. You mentioned earlier in the modern example, the muscles moving into the freshwater lakes, yes. changing the lake clock. Mm -hmm. So essentially what that's doing is stifling the local residents who are already there, yeah. so they can't diversify as much as they used to. Right. It's restricting what they can do, and that's what's causing most of the problems. Yes, exactly. So it doesn't necessarily seem to scale up to global extinction, but it causes severe community effects. And so the, spe the species were already there, uh, things like heronid midges that need um, muddy substrate to reproduce and to grow. These guys are having a really tough time. And they might be okay in another lake, but it's changing that immediate system and basically um, wiping them out and, and you know, then resulting in you know, not really any opportunities. Or if some big catastrophe comes along and changes the whole environment, yep. the invaders are used to doing it. Hey, they're just, they just moved in. Absolutely. They're used to coming in whatever their survival mechanism has. I guess the other question is then, let's say you have a major event that causes flooding, it causes not just these that you're studying, but a number of other species on here. These are maybe the tough guys that can survive such a transgression. Right. I don't want to get thrown. We're not Kansas anymore. We're not going to be able to survive it. They're gone right away in that area. You don't even know really that they've ever gone in the first place. Right. So few of us. No, you don't. So really what we're looking at is long-term survivability. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can get these epigal beds. I mean, you guys are familiar with the epigal beds around here. We get like the Retorsi Rostra layer. We're talking about like crazy amount of these guys. And then they just kind of peter out for a bit. Um, they hang around, but they're not, you know, nearly as abundant. So we can see short-lived events um, as long as they're resulted in enough biomass, mm -hmm. presumably. Yeah? Uh, actually, this is not for based on a question. Um, the zebra mussels have also pretty thoroughly invaded the Ohio River. Yes. And they're seeing the same effects in the river that we've seen in the lakes. Yeah. As Clear water? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, the zebra mussels have made it, as of three years ago, they've made it as far west as Kansas, and they've basically invaded every waterway along the way. They're amazing generalists. They can live everywhere. Um, it causes a lot of problems. But they do play the water. I have a question. If I understand this correctly, you're saying that it, when the invasive species come in, new speciation drops. Yes. Right? So, why, when a stress event happens, what, what is it about invasive species that make them not speciate, whereas the original species would have? Is well, it what, some, the same thing that makes them good invader species makes them less likely to, to change over time? Yeah, exactly. 
So um, the idea is, and, and this is something we can we can test with our new data set once we have our data acquired, mm -hmm. is that species that are invasive are ecological generalists. Mm -hmm. They can tolerate a lot of conditions. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the one of the aspects that predisposes them to being good invaders, mm -hmm. but it also means that it's very hard to speciate. Mm -hmm. Because if you can do everything, then there's really no way to subset part of your population. Mm -hmm. And so the generalist species overall, whether they're invaders or not, generalist species overall have much lower rates of speciation intrinsically. So things like horseshoe crabs, mm -hmm. um, where you get very long-lived species, compared to things like mammals that have very short-lived species. Well, could you could you 